Conversations with Nikki is brought to you by studyapps.co.za, South Africa's leading education app for tablets. Well, welcome, welcome. Conversations with Nikki it is. You're with Nikki Seberini, and uh, thank you so much for tuning in. It's fantastic to be with you once again. I'd like to welcome our syndication partner listeners um, up here in Joburg. That's Eldos FM, Chai FM, Kaui FM in Port Alfred, West Coast FM, that's in Namibia, Bay FM in PE, 90.3 MC in Plet, Nisne FM and Wild Coast FM in East London. And thank you so much for all the emails and responses to the shows. Um, it's really great to hear from you because uh, then I know what you're enjoying and what you're not enjoying. So if you have any input, any ideas, suggestions, please let me know. Do visit the website. In fact, I encourage you to go to that website because any of the shows that you have missed in the past or if you have to miss part of this show, every single show is podcast um, and the links to the podcast are put on the website. The website, very, very simple. It's the name of the show, Conversations with Nikki, which is one word. And Nikki is spelled N-I-K-I and it's dot C-O dot Z-A. And a lot of people responded and, and thank you for all the questions and the input um, with, with regards to last week's show when we spoke about the battle of the bulge and not looking at particular diets, but really listening to people's stories and looking at other reasons why people are, are carrying that excess weight. So a lot of people wanting to find out more about the uh, the leptin and uh, the the, the Insu- the insulin resistance and the the hypnotherapy and then of course Leanne was incredibly brave and she shared her story of uh, hope and of of seeing the light um, she was representing Overeaters Anonymous and she was talking about her addiction to certain foods and today's show we're going to be looking at addiction as well because uh, once again addiction is something that seems to be coming more and more common within our society whether it's an addiction to certain foods whether it's an addiction to alcohol drugs to gambling people are even talking about addiction to um, technology to our our mobile devices and uh, it's something that we really need to to talk about we need to look at the stories and uh, hopefully um, give hope to people who sometimes feel Feel that there is very little hope. So today we're going to be focusing on drug addiction. And when I say focusing on drug addiction, we're not going to be looking at statistics and the reasons why. I've got some incredible people who are going to be sharing their stories. And I'm hoping that through the story shared, um, there will be a connection. And uh, you may just enjoy the story or you may um, be feeling as if you're very alone and uh, that there are demons knocking on your door and you don't know what to do. And uh, or perhaps you know someone who's in that position. Position. And I really do hope that um, the stories will illuminate you and bring light and hope into your life. So we're going to move uh, forward as quickly as possible because uh, we don't want to waste time and, and uh, move away from the fantastic stories that you'll hear. I'd like to start off by introducing Marco Bricado uh, into the studio. He is the CEO of Eurocom. And uh, he's a recovering drug addict. And he founded Mountain Heights, this incredible initiative. So I'd like to welcome you, Marco. Thank you, Nikki. Thank, thank you. Good thank morning. you for coming in. Thank you. Thank Good you. Thank you. <laughs> so, Marco, what an interesting story you have. I mean, this that we, we could probably spend the whole <laughs> afternoon having this discussion. But let, let's just talk about the fact that you are a recovering drug addict. How did that happen? I think uh, for me, the one thing I, I do term is, is uh, I think that dr- Drug addiction can be beaten. I do think um, I consider myself a recovered addict, even though some people okay. just don't like to. But I think that at some point in your life, you've got to get over it and you've got to keep moving. Um, but I think, you know, how did it happen? I mean, like many silly children out there and, uh, you know, keep people making wrong choices. I made bad choices as growing up. A lot of peer pressure ended up going onto drugs and it led me into a pretty dismal path. I mean, as a crack cocaine and heroin addict by the time I was um, sort of 17, 18, um, I went through multiple suicide attempts, a whole lot of bad things, uh, did a lot of terrible things to my family. But fundamentally, um, my life was really on a path of destruction. Um, there was no hope. Um, eventually, I managed to go to rehab. I found, for me, my faith was what saved me. Um, and yeah, 15 years later, I consider myself to be a recovered addict. Recovered addict. So let's just rewind a little bit. You, okay. you talk about being a teenager, being a, a you know a child of the city, and we're exposed to so much, so many temptations, a lot of freedom as well. Let's look at your home life. I mean, uh, some people would look at statistics and talk about a poor home, um, abusive family. Did, is that your background at all? No. Um, I came from a great family. Um, 
I was the last born in an Italian family, so I was the last born, and I was the only boy, so I was treated like um, Ooh, like gold. Gold, I can yeah, imagine. So I, I, I had I, I never lacked for anything in my life. Mm. I mean, we were really my parents uh, gave us a good life as best they could. I mean, they worked for worked hard for us. So I grew up in a very functional and home environment. There was nothing that would ever point towards me becoming a degenerate or saying, "Oh wow, we can blame it on this or that." And I think there's also a challenge there. And it's not to say that, that circumstances can't assist in molding us into who we become. But I think fundamentally with drug addiction, and it's, the, it's about the choices we make no matter what circumstances mm. we're in. Okay. Um, so, yeah. So, for me, it was making bad choices amidst the good circumstances. Um, and that can happen. How, can these, how, how did these choices come your way, though? These kind of choices? I think, uh, you know, you, you surround yourselves, you know, there's a saying, you know, if you sit in a barbershop long enough, you're going to get a haircut, mm-hmm. you know, and I think if you surround yourself with people that are unsavory or people that are making the wrong decisions, ultimately you're going to go down that road. And I think the rot starts, I mean, I grew up hating drugs. I grew up with a passion and I was, I was, I was convinced that I would never do drugs. I, I looked down on Where people. Where did they come from? Just from, I mean, you know, Movies, you'd, you know, you'd watch stories media, on TV. Okay. And then also, the, you know, in, in school, we'd get guys and come do drug talks us in primary school. And right. I think, I'll never go down that road. You mm-hmm. know, it's not for me. And, you know, slowly, it's a slippery slope. You start, you know, making small allowances. You start drinking when you're young and, you know, you shouldn't. And then, you know, you start smoking a bit of weed and you think, okay, well, you know, maybe that's not a drug, but it actually is a drug. Before you know it, um, you know, you get introduced into some sort of hard drug environment and your friends that you respect and people that you know and that you have looked up to perhaps are doing it, you know. So you start thinking, well, it can't be that bad if these people, I know them well and they're doing it, so let me do it, you know. And ultimately, you know, you make those choices and you deal with the consequences later. But it's definitely about, you know, the decisions you make are often influenced by the people you hang around with, you know. So if you want to make good choices, you know, you need to make sure you're with people that are making the good choices. You know, if you're going to associate with people that are making bad choices, you are going to end up making bad choices. Do you know when you look at someone if you're going to be making the good or bad choices if you spend time with them? I, I mean, this is a challenge. Yeah, you, I mean, you're a parent. For sure. And I think, I'm a parent. Yeah. I think, I think it's, a, it's, it's very subtle. But I think that we all have that still small voice in our hearts where we know that we're in a, cert- we're in a situation that we shouldn't be in. Mm-hmm. I mean, I knew when I, what I was doing was wrong. Yeah. I mean, there was never a time where I thought, oh, well, this is okay. I'm not doing anything wrong. I knew when I started making those choices that they would alter. I never knew the, 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 the level that they would affect me later on. But I knew that. I shouldn't be doing this because, you know, this is A, something that I've always been against, but B, if my parents had to see me right now, Mm -hmm. what would they think? Mm. You know, so I think we've always, we can always, our conscience is quite active, you know, and, but we learn to, you know, dull it over time and we we put it aside and put it aside and ultimately making bad decisions becomes a lot easier. Mm. But I think for me, one of my passions and something that um, a good friend of mine, Alex, has, has really taught me is that, you know, life, making good decisions over and over and over again ultimately leads to, you know, success. But making Continuously making bad decisions or making bad choices will get you into a very dark place. And that's how the slope is very slippery because it starts off with a very small decision, a very mm. small choice. I know, mm. well, I'll sneak out or I'll lie. You know, and it starts just with that. Okay, so let me lie about something. Yeah. Automatically, you start training your mind that, you know, you, you automatically go to, you know, doing the wrong thing, you know. And the next time you face with a situation. Easier to lie. Correct. Mm. Then the lying becomes stealing or the stealing becomes taking drugs or taking drugs becomes shooting heroin or becomes trying to commit suicide. So it's, it's a process that evolves and it snowballs one from one bad choice into the next. Marco, do you think that you had some kind of predisposition to becoming addicted to drugs? I'm just, you know, a lot of people talk about marijuana being the gateway drug and there's some people who can smoke marijuana their entire lives and they never go um, onto any harder drugs and there are people who go with marijuana and within a short period of time. Well, what are your thoughts on that? I remember the first time I took um, a harder drug, so ecstasy or cocaine, and I was uh, 15 years old. And after I took it, uh, the first ecstasy tablets I'd taken and the first line of cocaine I had, I'd made a decision there and then that this was something I really want to become good at. I loved, I loved the experience well, just so just such much. an amazing sensation. Yeah, it was just amazing. I mean, the okay. fact is you don't become addicted to things that are terrible. Mm. I mean, you don't get addicted to eating broccoli. Right. Or, or perhaps some people do. Or eating Brussels sprouts in my case. <laughs> me too. But for... <laughs> With taking drugs, the sensation was just so amazing for me that I thought there can't be anything wrong with this. Mm. Um, I do think, I'm not sure if I was predisposed to it. I think that, you know, I was just really in the moment caught up in it and thought, well, let me do this. I think that what we often get confused, though, is, you know, sometimes, even though I may be able to get on my whole entire life with just smoking a bit of weed, um, you know, am I... 
you know fulfilled or happy as a person you know i don't know and mm. i think you know it, it's it's different strokes i mean for some of us we get involved very quickly and we go we progress very fast i mean for me i literally started in ecstasy and cocaine you know apart from the weed um but you know from there it was just you know anything was was was, was game for me there was no sort of limitations to what i would take or there was no real at the age of 17 you're talking about crack cocaine you're talking about heroin um, and then suicide attempts. How did that? What, what what was happening at that stage? Completely out of control. Yeah, I mean, so I mean, I'd, I'd managed to hide my addiction quite well. Mm. I think, well, I thought I, I hid it quite well, but uh, people know and people notice. But there's a thing called denial. So the people right. closest to you don't want to see it for what it is because they they just can't. They, your mind goes into a protective state and says, no, it can't be that, you know. Mm. And yeah, I mean, ultimately though, you you you, you start hating the person that you become because it's not really who you are and you never ever feel the way you did when you took that first hit um you're always constantly chasing that high it never happens again and uh, literally you become like the walking dead i mean you wake up every day you've only got one thing in your mind and that's how i'm going to get the next fix and really whatever it takes to get it will happen whether it's stealing you know robbing people lying cheating it doesn't matter um but i think over time i became epileptic because of um, all the drugs that i was taking mm -hmm. i was having 15 to 20 grand mal seizures a day um, sure. and at some point you know my my parents sort of realized you know this is what was going on you know my mom realized a lot later because she was mostly in denial and it wasn't her fault but you know I, I put a lot I put my family through a lot of pain and heartache and you know through that process I was stealing from them taking from them because it's the easiest place to stay to take from because mm -hmm. you're at home you know so you might as well steal what you can there um, and I think you know the disappointment that you have in yourself just becomes overwhelming um, because you don't enjoy it. It's mm. it's not a nice life. There mm. is no there's no hardcore addict or someone that's living on the street that that enjoys being there. So at that point, sorry to interrupt you, Marco. At that point, when you are stealing and you cheating and you are lying to your family and causing so much pain, are you? I mean, you're saying you're not enjoying it, but are you beyond having a conscience, or is the conscience still there? And is that part of what's tearing you up? Is seeing what you're doing to your family? Correct. I think the conscience is dulled. Okay, okay, so the conscience has no authority right. in your actions anymore. Okay. So the, the, you'll do whatever it takes to get it. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I went as far as even planning to murder my own parents so I could get the inheritance. I mean, that's where I was going in my okay. mind, as desperate as I was right at the end where I was really, really desperate. But the, your conscience never goes away, and that feeling of disappointment in yourself never leaves. It's just that it, it has no bearing on what you do. You mm -hmm. don't have the skills to be able to let that rule your decisions. You're still do the wrong thing you'll still do whatever it takes to get the drugs and and that's where suicide becomes an option because you feel so hopeless a lot of the times you know the first suicide attempts i had were attention seeking you know right. because again you know it's very easy to convince psychologists and psychiatrists that you really messed up and that your addiction is as a result of you know whatever problems you may be experiencing and it's mm. a great way out mm. i find i mean mm. and, and, and it's a problem that i i mean i struggle uh, with it quite often when i work with families you know, because I thought, you know, if, if I've got these psychological problems, then no one can really look at me and say, well, why are you taking drugs? Because mm. I've got these issues. But, um, you know, eventually when I did, when I was serious about it, I mean, I'd relapsed. I'd been to rehab. I'd come, I'd come out of rehab and I'd relapsed again. And I really felt so hopeless at that point. I, I hated what I was doing. I hated what I'd become. And I just knew that I was completely out of control. And I was lying in a bathtub in Hillbrow, and I said to myself, you know, that's it. I'm just going to, I'm going to end it. I'm, I'm, I've had enough now. And I slit my wrists in the bathtub. Hmm. And there was the second suicide attempt. And, you know, I realized in that moment, though, while I was doing it, because, you know, I did it properly this time. I mean, you know, blood was literally spraying across the room yeah. out of my arteries. And, yeah. and I realized, cheapest okay this is it you, you start know? to panic I, I realized i didn't want to die yeah you know i realized i actually don't want to die i mean wow. this is i don't want i don't want this to happen to me but i also knew in the back of my mind if i just called out for help then everyone would think i'm just looking for attention again so it was almost this, this self-fulfilling prophecy mm. that happened i just said well you know it's done now it's over and i remember getting really sick and because of all the blood loss I, be, I started you know vomiting and the next thing i know i'd completely i'd lost it i was out Ultimately, someone had found me, and when the, by the time the paramedics had got there, had, my heart had stopped already. So I was, I was, my flatlined, and they resuscitated me. And um, well, thank God they did. But yeah, I mean, it was. Do you remember anything? I remember, I remember being completely scared. I mean, I, I, I won't say it was an out of body experience, but I remember having fear. Fear. I can't explain it. Like I was just fearful, and I had this terrible feeling inside. I just. Wherever, whatever was happening wasn't good. Okay. I just knew that. And it didn't was, feel right. No, and it was just, it was scary. And then the next minute I remember opening my eyes, everything went quiet, opened my eyes and I was in the bathroom again. So 
I don't know. I, I pretty much assumed I was going to hell, mm. but because uh, that's where I deserve to go. But um, yeah, so I mean, and after that, there was still challenges. I mean, even after going through that, I then got committed to stay quarantine because they said I was uh, unfit to, I was a danger to myself and a danger to society. I was a pathological liar. And Stagmantine is a pretty crazy place. Um, it's for the criminally insane. Mm. It's, you know, it's a prison really for people that have mental disorders. Mm. And I just sort of um, thought, you know, you'd think that that would scare you enough to want you to change or to make you change. And I spent six weeks there, didn't change, came out, went back to So this, this near-death experience didn't shift you? No. Okay. Because my heart hadn't changed, you know. Okay. I hadn't, I hadn't really made. Any it wasn't choices. the epiphany, is Correct. what I'm saying. No, okay. it wasn't. That mm. was just like, wow, ooh, that was pretty crazy. All but right. Let me carry on. I mean, mm-hmm. I hadn't made that choice yet. Mm. And then after statement, you know, I, again, I'd had many car accidents because of my epilepsy. But you know, at at one point, right at the end, so this was just before I went to my last rehab, I had a car accident, and I'd really disappointed my family again. And I was lying in hospital, and my mother, my mother walked into the ER, and she said to me, "I wish you'd just die." Oh you know, my she, God. I wish you'd actually, I wish you'd just die so that oh. I know that I, I know that you're dead and I can bury you. And then this part of our lives would be over and you mm. wouldn't be hurting yourself or anyone else. Hmm. And that was the first For time. For a mom to say that. Eh? Yeah. And, and, yeah. That was the fir- and then that was the first time that I'd really realized the true devastation that I'd caused. And my sister came to see me and she said to me, you know what? We're sending you to Noput and just so that you understand and we're very clear. We don't care if you get on the bus or you don't get on the bus. We don't care if you go to rehab and you sort your life out. We're doing this so that we can go to sleep at night and know that we did everything to help you. But from this moment onwards, you're dead to us. Hmm. You know, you, know, you don't come home after the hospital. You've got to know we're dead to you. And I think that sort of tough line and, and, and tough love approach really like Woke got to me. Because yeah. I realized, I mean, I had known all along, but I mean, now you know, there was nowhere to hide. I knew all the damage I'd caused and the destruction I'd caused. And I knew I didn't want to be this person anymore. So... I took that opportunity and I said to myself, I'm going to go to Noput and I don't care if I have to be there for the rest of my life. I'm not leaving until I change. And I actually had a desire to want to change. And that was the changing point. It was that I'd actually made the decision that no matter what it took, no matter how hard it was, I was going to come back a better person. And I did. I went there. Um, I spent almost three years in Noput. Sure. I spent eight months on the program and then I worked there and I helped out. I met my wife there, got married in Noput, and I've been clean for 15 Marco, years. Marco, what a story. Mm. And you met her and you got married there in no yes. but the, But the important thing was before you went, you had made the decision Correct. that this was it. You were going to fight That's right. to live yes. and to change. Yes. And your family, were they there? Yeah, I mean, it, it took time. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't a quick thing. Um, it took my, my mom especially because I probably I damaged her the most. Um, but yeah, I mean, now... I have the best relationship with my family. There's complete restoration. Uh, it, it's like as if nothing's ever happened. Mm. I mean, but I mean, you know, the scars are still there every yeah. now and then. You know, you can see them, and there's the consequences that I have to deal with. I mean, because of my behaviour. But yeah, I mean, it's I'm really blessed today. An incredible story when you think of how close you came to to not being able to walk away and tell the story. Now, Marco, you founded Mountain Heights. It's this yes. in, just tell us about this initiative and why. Okay, so I mean, I knew that when I'd come clean from addiction, that um, my wife and I both knew at that stage that you know it wasn't just about us. You know that if we could beat it and and we could feel completely redeemed from it. I mean, and that's why I, I, I really do consider myself a recovered addict because I've realised now, like, I'm not an addict anymore. I'm I'm set free completely. Right. And I say because that I, it's interesting that we're talking about recovered and recovering because correct. of the NA approach to it. But yes. and, I, and I hear you. You're, it's over for yes. you. It's it's past. For me, it is past. For mm. me, it was a choice um, and it was a decision. Um, and we had made this choice. And and I wanted to really. I, I completely felt liberated. And again, I mean, I think the NA programs are great, and all the programs out there are amazing. You know, mm. and it's different strokes for different people. But for me, the one challenge I had was. I was always constantly reminding myself pre sort of before this before I really came before I, I went to my last year that I was I was a drug addict and I was suffering from this disease of addiction mm-hmm. and for me it was a, it, again it was a negative reinforcement on a daily basis and that you were powerless to it I was I was powerless and okay. that was it I had to just reside myself to the fact that this is who I was going to be for right, the rest of my life right but when, when I had this revelation you know but once it come come clean I realized that no, this is a choice. You know, I can be, I can, I can live a normal life. I can be, I can be a, a really productive part of society. I can have a family. I can have a life, and I don't need to have this thing over my shoulder anymore. And 
It was that hope that we wanted to impart to other people that drug addiction can be beaten, that if you make the right decisions and you take that step, and it's hard, it's not easy, it's not a fickle, it's not just ah uh, flippant. I'm at, I'm I'm clean now and I'm mm. I'm I'm recovered because there's a process, you know. But there's a moment where you realize that I'm actually set free from this. You know, I don't, I don't have to be this person anymore, and I just wanted to spread that hope, and that's why we set up Mountain Heights was to do that. And what is it? So it's an initiative, it's a non-profit organization, and it, there's three main pillars within the organization. The first is raising awareness about the plight of addicts and the fact that drug addiction can be beaten, and how we do that is through extreme events. So we climb mountains, uh, very high peaks. Mm-hmm. The mountains are symbolic of the mountains we face as addicts. Right. Um, that, you know, and, and just like addiction, a mountain can be conquered. You can get to the summit. Mm-hmm. It may look very hard and it may look difficult, and along the way you're going to have a lot of challenges, but you can get there. you just got to put one foot in front of the other. So the mountains is the one side of it, um, and we climb big peaks, so big peaks, sorry, like Aconcagua, Kilimanjaro. Um, we actually will probably be climbing Peak Wilhelm in Papua New Guinea next year, wow. Everest hopefully in two years' time. And mm. we take a team of ex-addicts on so the mountain. So three so far, yeah? Yes, okay. yeah, three so far. Okay, so carry on, you take So addicts. we take ex-addicts with yes. us, guys that have been through the process, that have come clean. Um, you know, again, because you know, if, if I could, believe me, if I can climb a mountain, then anyone can climb a mountain. You know, I was I was written off by society. Mm. There was there was nothing good in me. Mm. Um, but so the mountains is one side. This year we also had an expedition to the desert, the empty quarter. We did the first unsupported crossing of the empty quarter. So we set a world record. We walked from Salale in Oman to Dubai, wow. 1,208 kilometers, completely unsupported. We pulled all our own water, our own food for 40 days. And that why also the empty quarter? Because I mean, it, it, what was that symbolic of? Yeah, that was, I mean, Alex, a uh, very good friend of mine, in fact, you'll be chatting to him now. I mean, he's one of sort of South Africa's, you know, leading ex- uh, explorers. And he was on Everest one year with uh, Randolph Fines. And he said to Randolph, you know, what's the last greatest expedition to be done? Because everything's been done. People mm. walk to the poles, they've crossed the oceans. Mm. And he said to him, cross the empty quarter, uh, MC, empty quarter unsupported, you know, cause, but you'll die. It's never been done for, but you'll die. And it got this thing, the seed was planted in oh. Alex's mind. So when Alex and I had met four years ago about the mountains, he said, look, he's playing around with this idea about this desert. And I was like, hey, you know, I'm in. Let's just do it because it sounded like a challenge. Uh, and again, the desert, again, was symbolic for me because along your road to becoming recovered, you know, it often feels like you're in the wilderness. You really are in a desert. Mm. I mean, things are bleak. It's hard. But again, it's about making you know, a good a good choices one after the other. And mm-hmm. for me, it was like putting my foot, one foot in front of the other every day in the desert. It ultimately got us over 1,208 kilometers. Wow. Wow. So it was very symbolic and we did it. And, and it you've come back in one piece. I mean, I'm looking at you literally in one piece, yeah, a lot, which is a good thing. A lot thinner, <laughs> a lot thinner, but in <laughs> one piece, yes. <laughs> did you lose a fortune I of did. water, I'm sure? Fortune of water, of weight, but uh, my wife's happy with the weight that I'm at now, so it was a good thing. So if, you ever, if you know anyone, that, like you were talking about uh, the Dieting. battle of the bulge, we'll, we'll take people the across the desert. Quarter. There, we, there go. we go. So listen, with, before we chat to, to Alex, the, the, the point of Mountain Heights, so it's an awareness, um, it's a fantastic initiative to give hope to um, drug addicts and recover drug addicts. Is there fundraising? Are you raising funds to help with, with for, for, for drug addicts perhaps who can't afford? Because we know rehab can be very expensive. Yeah. So yeah, so I mentioned the two. So the one pillar was the, the ex- okay. extreme expeditions. The next one is um, funding treatment for guys that cannot afford to go to treatment at the moment. So we look at people that are currently in the throes of addiction. Mm-hmm. We help those that are really destitute to find funding for world-class treatment. So we don't send them to government centres. We send them to private facilities, and they cost us anywhere from you know sixty thousand rand for six months to. You know, it, it's a hell of a lot of money. Sure. But so basically, we provide funding for these families. We've funded and we've assisted over 22 families so far. Brilliant. Um, and the great thing is that our success ratio is Mount Tonight. So we've had about over 50%, in fact, more. It's about 70% of the people that we sponsor come out and are clean for longer and they actually come and work in my business. So we reintegrate them back into society, we give them a job. Um, and and that's Eurocom. Normal, correct. Okay. So they become normal parts of society. And the reason why we started funding addicts, and apart from the funding, we also do counseling and we work with families and we do interventions. But beyond that, um, the ultimate goal for us was to build world-class treatment facilities that were free. And when I say free, people that could afford to go can pay. Mm-hmm. But the challenge we, I have with treatment facilities today is that they're so exclusive. I mean, people are struggling to get to find the money to go into treatment and, mm. and I think it's so wrong. I think people should have access to treatment. I don't think it's something that should be only for the select few. Um, so 
our ultimate goal is to build these rehab centers, but it's, it's not something that's going to happen overnight, and it's, it, it requires a lot of funding. At the moment, this entire initiative, Mountain Heights, the mountains, funding the addicts, is all done through Eurocom, my business. Um, and, you know, the economy has been tight, so, I mean, we are always looking for potential so your partners. company's funding this? Yes, my whole business, my company's funded everything. Wow, I mean, I'm shaking my head, and um, that's just fantastic. Thank I mean, you. it really is fantastic. So let's let's talk about your business just now, okay. um, because that's just such a, a, a much bigger purpose, which is great. Let, should we talk to Alex quickly? Yes, let's do it. Because I think it's a good time to bring Alex, the adventurer, we'll call him, um, uh, onto uh, the show. Um, hi, Alex. Uh, it's it's great hi, to have you on the show. Thank you. It's good to be here. So listen, Alex, I believe that. At the age of 25, you were the youngest person ever to lead an expedition to Mount Everest. And I have to ask the question, why? Yeah, look, that's Not why young, were you uh, the youngest, why? Why do you do it? Oof, I mean, it's a long time ago and my memory has been jaded now with oh, my oh. altitude and I'll, box <laughs> it, I'll, I'll try and think back to the heyday of youth. When you throw yourself in the deep end, simply on passion and, and this ideal and, and you learn... Uh, you know, you haven't done adequate preparation. I mean, I guess any climber at some point in their, their life will look at a photo of Everest and wonder, could they, should they, what will it be like? Mm. And, and that for me came in, in my mid-twenties. I mean, I'd been climbing for about six, seven years, I guess. And through some unusual circumstances, ended up as leader of a team and a permit to go to Everest and the option to either back out or to go and see what it was about. And, and we chose to go. It must have been an extraordinary experience. Yeah, it was pretty intense. I mean, 96 was the most fatal year in Everest history. Of course, <laughs> it famously uh, killed 15 people. We went in post-monsoon season, so after the, the sort of furore of all, all that uh, mayhem in, in the May. But it was still an unsettled year, and it was a tough time to be on Everest. And, of course, we were young. We had no shirts, We had no oxygen. We just had huge enthusiasm. And, uh, you know, Everest is is a place that requires a little bit more than enthusiasm. But it was good. I mean, it gave us a lot of credibility. And it started a business. It started a, a vacation for me and, and just a, a new sense of purpose and direction in life. So it was a, it was a catalyst. Hmm. So, Alex, how did you come across Marco? And he tells me that I, I gave a talk at his church on, on a Sunday yonks ago mm -hmm. and he'd been wrestling with this idea of climbing mountains God had given him a, a seed and, and, and my talk had been seen around kind of purpose and, and Everest and, and so he SMSed me afterwards saying look he, he was sitting in, in the audience he had this talk he was inspired and he wanted to know if we could touch base and so I met him um, he said he's got these ideas and, and obviously I get you know my business revolves around ideas around you know with Everest and other mountains so I get opportunities all the time people with hairbrain schemes and, mm. and ideas and so I, I, I met Marco and thought mm, well you know let's see what he's got to say and he was passionate and he had a, a worthy cause he had an amazing story himself his personal journey and it was something that excited me and and we kind of started with some of the easier seven and one thing led to another, and I guess when you kindred spirits with, with a similar purpose in your life, the only way it manifests might differ, but you, you, you're going to end up in, in tough situations, you know, like the desert. Uh, and this is a guy who wasn't supposed to, I don't know if he's told you that, you know, after his accidents, he was never supposed to walk again. So when he, when he crossed the Arabian desert and his ankle held, I knew that uh, yeah, he, was, he, was, he was serious about his, mm. his ideas and, and his passion. Mm. Alex, I mean, you, you knew about his past, obviously, because of the, uh, the Mountain Heights initiative. But did, yeah. you ever, did you ever stop and think, well, hang on, do I want to be climbing a mountain? I mean, how reliable is this guy? I mean, he's a recovered drug addict. He's talking about bringing other recovered drug addicts. Is there a risk involved? I think there's a risk in anything of value in life. You can't take a, a journey somewhere special and, and not have some risk. And I think sometimes the risk is greater when you don't take action and, and, and you don't begin that journey. I mean, I'll share two stories with you. Marco uh, confessed to us when, once we crossed the desert, because, of course, he, he's been clean for 13 years, but he hasn't lost some of his, his dogged determination and, and uh, tendencies. So he told us one, one day that uh, on the expedition he'd been thinking up ways he could break the cart that it looked like an accident because he, he knew if the cart broke it would be game over and we'd have to call the rescuers. <laughs> and eventually, 
eventually <laughs> confessed that he couldn't think of a creative way to break the car, so he gave up that idea. <laughs> and then there were days he was trying to, he wondered if he snuck out in the night and helped himself to some of the water in our <laughs> containers, the team water, whether we would know. And he, he, he said he was flooded by this sense of guilt because we'd agreed and made a pact as a team, mm. and he knew he would feel this guilt forever. So, you know, the, the thing is, he's been there, he's fought, and he, he's, he's, he's testifying to a victory, and that's hope. And, and if we don't have hope in people that can change, then, you know, our, our lives are, are meaningless. Oh, indeed, uh, it is a story of hope. Listen, Alex, we're going to just put you on hold for just, uh, or not on hold, we're just going to take a quick break. Uh, we'll be back in just a moment. Stay with us. Sure. Hi, my name is Esvia Prinsler. And I'm the HOD of IT integration at Bridwin Preparatory School in Melrose. We started using study apps about six months ago and have seen astonishing results. We were quite amazed to see how quickly the kids have been able to use study apps and the benefits it has shown with regards to reinforcing what they've already learned inside the classroom. I would highly recommend study apps for any school. Studyapps.co.za well, welcome back. If you've just tuned in, this is Conversations with Nikki, and I'm Nikki Seberini, and I'm delighted to be with you. And uh, the show's been so interesting because we're talking about hope, and we're talking about overcoming great obstacles, and sometimes going from the very darkest of dark to the illuminance that light can bring. Um, and uh, the story has been Mark Brocado, who is the CEO of Eurocom, who has been sharing his story um, on of fighting um, his addiction to drugs, um, his addiction to crack cocaine and heroin, his attempts at suicide, and then moving into the light and being clean for 15 years now, married with two children, with a very successful business, Eurocom, which is funding this incredible initiative called Mountain Heights, and that is about uh, the Seven Summits Challenge, and also this empty quarter um, that they successfully crossed earlier this year. And I have Alex Harris who's a, a, an adventurer and that's what he does he takes people on these expeditions and Alex and Mark are very good friends so Alex I, I just wanted to ask you I mean this empty quarter um, going along the uh, p which is part of the Arabian desert and unsupported yeah. well, what is that what do you mean by unsupported what have you got a tent and a few bottles of water and that's that look it means in its purest sense not getting help from anyone along the way so being completely self-reliant, carrying all your food in a cart and saying no to every temptation along the way when someone offers you some food and then only filling up with water at uh, pre-sort of determined uh, wells or historically where, where guys are filled up with wells. So, you know, just not willy-nilly taking water everywhere and Cokes and Pepsis. And, and I must tell you, it was an enormous temptation because you start the journey with this ideal and very quickly you realize it's mid 40 degrees which is pretty hot and a land cruiser stops next to you and offers you some ice cold pepsis <laughs> and now you start questioning mm. the sanity of it all so that was the ethics we we wanted to to cross under you know our own support our steam our power how many were there of you three of us okay so it was you marco and and david joyce who's been a lifelong adventure racing and cycling friend of mine, so a guy who knows how to suffer and can be comfortable while suffering, which is an important quality. We need to walk across the desert. That's very interesting. I'm not. I don't know many people who are comfortable with suffering. Yeah, look, I mean, a life of going to unusual places teaches you that one skill, and it's not that we have a greater it's just you learn, you just to, learn how to adapt. To be with it, to be with yeah. suffering. Mm. Marco, do you think, I mean, with the amount of suffering that you've endured, is that when you are living with that suffering, how, how does it feel for you? Is it like a self-punishment? Do you feel like you deserve that feeling? Or have you just learned to cope with that suffering? We, we're talking about the, about the desert now. Yeah. No, I think, I think it was a whole level, new level of suffering. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I think, I mean, yeah, I think... Uh, my experiences and, and having gone through what I'd been through, you know, m helped me in one way, but didn't help me in another. Drug addicts are notoriously bad at sticking at it, sticking through anything. Mm -hmm. I mean, we are bad at that. I mean, we just will go for the easiest or the path of least resistance, and no matter what we do, even though we're so dogged in our determination to use drugs, 
But I mean, the desert was was a challenge all on its own, and it was an opportunity for me to prove that not only could I actually stand, you know, and do something that was so monumental, but you know, just deal with the hardships that it threw at me. And and it, it was. I mean, thank goodness. I mean, Alex put us through a lot of training beforehand, so I learned how to suffer with Alex quite a lot before that. Okay. But uh, <laughs> it's yeah, been it's been extended uh, suffering, is what you're saying. Correct. Yes, but it's, it was amazing, and I mean, I think yeah, I think. There were moments where I had to remind myself why I was doing it, you know, I mean, because like Alex said, you, you actually start questioning yourself, like, what is the point? Mm. And I realized that, you know, for me, I had a very clear vision and the vision was to bring hope. And for me to just, you know, drop out or fall away was just wasn't good enough. So it was a far greater purpose. For correct. You. I had to get through it because I was talking about hope and mm. the hope was for me to get to the other end, mm. and just like you to beat addiction. So I had no choice but to carry on. And Alex, I mean, you take people on expeditions all the time um, and people are really challenging themselves and learning to live in this uncomfortable place. So for Marco, it was hope. Do you do you often have to be um, very present and climb into the headspace of the people that you're taking on that expedition um, to face whatever challenges they're facing? Is that part of what you do? Yeah, it is, but I guess you you preempt the whole process. So, I mean, the easiest thing we do is Kilimanjaro, which is obviously very familiar to people. Mm. But whatever trip we're doing, it's, it begins a long time beforehand with a training program. And so the individuals get to mix with us and spend time with us and glean strategies uh, and, and just ways to cope. And, and you change the focus from just the summit to the journey. Mm. So by the time we get to the expedition, they're in a far more mature mindset than your average kind of executive uh, or, or, or individual that might come from a corporate world and, and suddenly want to do something like this, you know. So, uh, I mean, I, I haven't had a lot of uh, occasions where people are just, compete, they go pear-shaped and now you really have to get inside their head. Mm. You know, it's typically you invest time and energy in the build-up to it. So by the time the person gets there, they, you know, they've stretched themselves and, and they, they're operating at a whole nother level. But of course, Everest is a whole different story. Uh, Marco was talking about Everest in two years' time. Um, yeah. How do you prepare yourself for something like that? Look, you have to. There are a couple of parts to the preparation. One is is focused, specific skills, learning how to uh, just handle ropes in, in cold conditions, and, and that will have to simulate on some of the other lower seven, uh, like Aconcagua in South America. But then there's the you know the mental stuff, being mm. able to sit. For long periods of time with the outcome uncertain and out of your hands and and you you have to get to a place where you're comfortable with that that you're comfortable with the fact that you can invest an enormous amount of time energy and money and do the right things make the right decisions and still not get the outcome you want and a lot of people especially you know guys that come from successful backgrounds they they don't understand that you know yeah. in their mind they apply a formula the outcome's pretty much guaranteed and it's the desired outcome that's not the case in mountains because there's a lot out of your hand mm. and that's the you know you can be the fittest strongest person on Everest summer day comes you might get bad weather and that's it doesn't matter and and then again you can be a relatively unfit inexperienced person on Everest but if you get great weather on summer day your chances are you're going to get up so mm. it's a funny game to play. I think that's interesting. It's uh, relinquishing control. And Marco, you spoke um, a lot about choices. Um, so you still have a choice, though. Correct. You know, where and what you're going to do with that. Alex, thank you so much. Thanks for your time. Thank that's you for pleasure. sharing some stories with us. And um, yeah, all the very best. And hopefully we'll hear about a successful climb to, uh, to Everest. What do they call it? It's not a climb. It's a? Ascent. Ascent. There we go. Thanks, well, Alex. thanks for having me. Thank that's you. It's been pleasure, super. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So, Marco, Everest, I mean, the you know, more mountains to climb, more challenges, and you're just going to continue working hard and um, raising funds so that you can inspire others and, and get others to realize that there's hope. Yes. Um, I mean, that's a, I mean, eventually when the mountain's all done, there's always a mountain to climb. There's always a desert to cross. There's always an ocean to swim across. There's always something to be done, much to my wife's demise. I mean, she's like... Uh, you must drive her insane. Yeah, she's, she's actually quite... She's, she's a draw instructor, actually. I mean... You know, on the days in the desert, a drill when, instructor. Not really. I'm saying with oh. me. You know, she's not. She's <laughs> quite impressed. Well, I suppose she she has to be. She's got two little boys at home, including me. There's three boys. Uh. But my life is a huge source of inspiration to me. And I mean, even in the desert, when when things were tough, and the days where I'd phone her, and she would just like, hey, you know, buck up. You got to just remember why you're doing this. And she was amazing. 
but yeah, I mean, there'll always be something to do. So even once you've climbed Everest, there'll be something else. You know, there's always a way to inspire hope. And maybe mm. it's not as extreme as Everest. Um, and also maybe it's involving people that are involved in drugs with small expeditions, you know, reasons for them to, to realize, wow, there's so much out there, you know. One thing that expeditions do do for you is they open your eyes to the enormity of, of what potential you have inside of yourself. I mean, things that you never thought you could do become evidently done in an mm, expedition. You, you know? realize you can overcome yeah. any obstacle. Correct. Well, most obstacles. Listen, in 2010, you were awarded the Top Young Entrepreneur of the Year Award. Um, and you've had incredible success with your business. And let's just go back and remember that 15 years ago, you were rock bottom. Um, your family had closed the door and said, you know, that's it. We're walking away. So whether you make it or not, we don't we, we don't care anymore. Mm. And um, I, I'm just with with everything that you've overcome. I mean, having a successful career must be a huge inspiration to people who are overcoming drug abuse and addiction. I, I hope it is. And I, and I think it's just another way for us to bring hope. Um, and believe me, again, if I can do this and if I can be a successful businessman, then anybody can. And what does um, Eurocom do, just by the way? We're an interaction-based marketing specialist company, so we build platforms for radio stations, TV media owners, as well as brands that drive consumer interactions, and we aggregate and manage the data, we segment data, we give them analytics and reporting on any type of digital interaction, so from mobile to web to social media, everything. Um, but again, again, if I could do it, and believe me, I'm no one special than anyone can. And the one thing I have found there about addicts in particular is we're very tenacious in our addiction. We'll do whatever it takes to use. When you can take all that energy and now you're clean and you can actually apply it to something that's worthwhile, whether it is a business, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, an experience, it's an expedition, it's your family, you're so much more passionate about it. Um, and I've often found that ex-addicts have become very successful businessmen because, you know, I'd hate to say we're movers, but we know how it is to operate and to mm. work hard and, and to, you know, put our heads down and just keep going. Um, Do you think you're less afraid of failure? I think I've failed more times than most people will ever fail in their lives. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's still, uh, there's still opportunity for failure. I'm by no means anywhere near perfect. Uh, I make mistakes every day. Um, like Alex said, even on the desert, I mean, I had crazy thoughts. I mean, I thought I'm going to break that cart <laughs> because then I can go home. But, you know, I make mistakes in business. I make mistakes at home. Mm -hmm. I make mistakes everywhere. But what inspires me to continue going is the fact that I've got this life, you know, that, that I already had no life. And I've been blessed with this opportunity to, to do something with myself and with my life. And that's what I'm passionate about doing. So if it's about helping people, if it's about, you know, building a business that can help more addicts. And that was actually why I started the company was that I realized we had this whole vision and I was working in sort of normal jobs, corporate world. And I thought I'm never going to get enough money this way to climb mountains. So mm. my wife and I said, well, let's, you know, let's, let's do this. Let's start a business, you know, because then we can fund it. And that's actually how Eurocom started. So the, the vision for the business is my addiction story. Right. And that's what keeps me going to work every day. Um, you know what I'm, I'm interested to ask, Marco, because I think that pe when people have a, a near-death experience or they've been told that they have some illness and it could be fatal and all of a sudden they start to see life differently, the world seems to change before their eyes. But I just wonder how long that honeymoon period lasts for because with everything you just kind of settle back into old habits. Has that happened? I mean, you spoke about the fact that you, what you've been through and that you're just so happy to be alive and it is one of your inspirations. But do you really feel that all the time? Is that, do you know what I'm saying? Is that honeymoon phase with you all the time? And if not, how, how do you bring it up and, 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 and relive that, that true gratitude and appreciation? I think it's exactly what you said. It's about being grateful. Um, okay. when, we, when, we, when we neglect to be grateful every day, we start ending up going on a very dark road. And for me, literally waking up in the morning and being able to look at you know, my beautiful wife and my beautiful children really inspires me every day to want to carry on. And, and that's what keeps me going. And it really does. It, it inspires me. And I'm so blessed. I mean, every day I remind myself how lucky I am. And it really is. It's never, it's never gone. Uh, I, I'm as passionate about what I want to do today as I was 15 years ago. And, it's, it's, and yeah, I mean, you have bad days. I mean, you, everyone does. You know, we're not we're perfect. Correct. We have days when we, we're depressed or we're sad or whatever the case is. But it's bigger than that. You know, this thing is bigger than all of us. It's bigger than me. It's bigger than my family. It's, 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 it's a passion that has really gripped my heart. You're a father of two. I am. How has it affected the way you parent? 
Funny enough, my my son was actually at a, uh, a function the other night at, at at our church where they 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 showed a video a testimony of my life and my older boy is seven and you know although he's heard about it he's never really realised and this video was quite graphic it was almost like a it was a very creative way of showing you know like this transformation and my son said to me did you really try to kill yourself dad you know and so he knows yeah now he's asking the question he's like mm. well you're a drug addict and. You know, for me, I've, I've always been open with them and I've never hid it and I would never hide it. I don't hide it in business. I don't hide it. It's part of my life. Mm-hmm. But I think how it, how it affects me as a parent is, you know, again, it's, there's no guarantees. You know, all I know is that I can, the best thing I can do for my children is show them the power of choice and that the consequences, there's consequences for everything we do. So whether it's a good choice or a bad choice, there's going to be consequences. So my passion is about clearly defining those those choices for them and saying to them, you know, that don't make the same mistakes I did. You don't have to. And often I think, you know, I'm going to be a very strict parent. I'm going to test them every week when they get to the teenagers. I'm going to make sure that they come home. And like a drug test. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, that's not the answer, you know. Um, so um. it's about it's just about instilling in them the power of their choice and helping them realize it. And we try to do that from a very young age. Alex spoke about church and you've just spoken about church. Mm. Is religion a very big thing and has it always been? For me, it's uh, it's core to my success. I mean, I went to lots of rehabs, and the, ultimately, I went to a rehab that was a faith-based Christian program. And for me, it's what changed me. So okay. I really, it was by the grace of God that I've been changed, and, and it's something that's a, a huge part of my life. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's really, it's 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 been the rock that I've based my entire recovery on. And a, a lot of recovering addicts, alcoholics talk about uh, you know a higher purpose a, hi- a higher being whatever that is um, that helps them through it so because I'm going to be talking to Anwar in a moment and he's going to be talking from an NA perspective and that is very much the higher mm. purpose so so that played an instrumental part in your recovery and, and continues to do so for me 100% I think also one thing I, re- I mean for any addict I mean addiction is just the manifestation of a phobic of, of a of an underlying problem and we fill our hearts and our and our bodies with this addiction because we're lacking something and for me it's always been whether you are depressed you suffer from depression whatever it is you know addiction is just another way of, of acting out on that and for me it was you know this void that i always had and that i filled with drugs mm-hmm. and i've been filled you know with christ and, okay. and that's for me with faith Fantastic. Marco, stay where you are because I have Anwar on the uh, line who is a recovering addict um, to share his story. Anwar, thank you very much for joining us. You're very welcome and good afternoon. So Anwar, you and I chatted yesterday and what I find so interesting is just like Marco, you didn't come from a background where there was abuse, um, where there was poverty, where there was lack of education or or anything like that. In fact, you came from the complete opposite. Your family um, were a close-knit family. They were extremely well-to-do. You were given everything that a child could ever want. Pretty much so. I mean, I, I, I didn't necessarily view it that way. In retrospect, you know, there was nothing that I wanted for. So you're absolutely right. If, if you're asking if there were any real contributory issues to to where I eventually ended up, no, there weren't. Mm. So Anwar, M- Mark was sharing his story and, uh, you know, just about... Uh, spending time with people who were influencing him badly and making the wrong choices. What would you say um, if, if you had to look at the choices you made um, when you were first introduced to drugs and you became addicted to drugs? Would you say that it had to lot, a lot to do with the people that you were mixing with? Was it just um, something that happened? Um, and and, and how, how would that affect the way you would parent, for example? I think for me it you know, I'd be out of line if I apportioned blame. Um, was there any peer pressure where the guys around me experimenting with drugs and alcohol, you know, when we were 14, 15 years old, and cigarettes? Yes, they were. Um, I think there was a huge element of teenage curiosity for me. Um, you know, <laughs> the first thing I, I, I smoked something and, and the first time I drank something, I, I actually enjoyed the feeling. So I didn't, I didn't necessarily start out on this um, age to become an addict because, you know, I was, I was forced into something. Mm. I, I really wasn't. Okay. And well, we're going we're gonna to try and call you again because it's an awful line. So we're going to say goodbye and let's, uh, on a technical side, let's try and get hold of you again and hopefully we'll be able to continue with our discussion because what you have to say is very important and it's looking from an NA perspective. Um, so has Anwar gone and are we trying him again?
Fantastic. Um, so, Marco, let me ask you, I mean, you talk about re- rehab, but you haven't spoken about Narcotics uh, Anonymous. Um, was it ever something that you considered? Yeah, I, I went to, um, I mean, I went to four rehabs in total. So before uh, I came clean and a lot of the treatment set facilities I went through were 12 step based and mm-hmm. NA was a part of the program and I did, I went to many NA meetings and yeah, I did go through it a lot. Okay, but no port was where it all happened for you. Correct. Uh, and again, I mean, one thing I must say is that it's not about the place. I think it's a lot to do with the choice. Um, yeah, I was going to say because you you've said that when you when you went to no port, you had a completely different attitude. Correct. I could have gone to no port first, and it wouldn't have changed me. You know, not necessarily. So I think for me, it was a combination of things. It was the fact that I was ready now to change. Uh, I made the right choices, and I was right in the sense that we had to take ownership. And for me, that was a big thing. It was about taking ownership of where I was and making the right choices from there. Okay. Do any of the people um, that you are with have they are they part of NA? Do you know of? Uh yeah. No. I think. Um, the, I mean, I do have friends of mine that still go to NA groups for sure. Um, you know, and yeah, you know, the guys. Because that, because that's a completely different approach. I mean, we were talking about a little bit earlier. You talk about being a recovered addict. Yeah. And NA, they say I'm recovering. I have this disease, um, and I'm always fighting this disease. Correct. So I, they I, must, they must have. You must have interesting discussions with those friends who are then. We do, and I also have a very close friend of mine who runs a group, um, a very a, a faith-based group also. But they also follow sort of the NA sort of twelve-step methodology. And, and I say to them often, I say, look, well, let's not get caught up in. You know, mm. I'm, I'm really believe I'm free and I'm, I'm happy and mm. you believe that you'll be suffering for this life. that's fine you know that's cool but you know it's just we're both trying to do the same thing we right. want to bring hope to people and let's do that and right. that's what the important part mm. is and well, I believe uh, you're back on the line we do hope it's a clearer line hello hi oh there you are there you are Thank okay you. so <laughs> so we, you, you were just talking about the fact that it uh, taking drugs and how it felt good and that you you can't necessarily blame anyone else but you you let I think that what I found so interesting about your story yesterday is is that people can stereotype. So if you're looking at drug addicts, you're looking at, um, as I mentioned earlier, where you an, up, an upbringing, no money, but you you had a complete opposite situation. So you always had success, you always had money, you always had the support. How did that spiral out of control through taking the drugs? Well, you know, when I initially tried drugs and alcohol, it it, it just elevated the feeling and. It made me feel good um, very quickly for me, and it might be different for other people, but very quickly for me, you know, tolerance set in, and, and I found myself doing more and more to to experience the same feeling. Mm. Um, and I moved from substance to substance, um, you know, ch- chasing the same kind of high. In time, um, I found that it, it was really a cool thing to use drugs and alcohol to elevate a feeling of, of happiness or, or any good feeling. Or it was also something that I could rely on to numb feeling. Uh-huh. So, so really it became ultimately, you know, there was a complete reliance on drugs for whatever I was feeling. Mm. And how did you come across NA, Narcotics Anonymous? Well... I kind of, I think at some point my family went to, to Tough Love. Um, they were given some contact details from Narcotics Anonymous. I, I didn't, I wasn't interested in attending. I didn't think I really had a problem. I thought that the world was overreacting to what was going on for me and they didn't understand. Um, but I did find myself at some point, not for the right reason, but I did find myself in a treatment facility. Mm. And, uh, and through them, I was introduced to Narcotics Anonymous. So I was almost forced to my first meeting. Um, you know, and I found like-minded people. My initial reaction to it was I, I was quite toxic and psychotic. Mm. Um, and my initial reaction was that my family had somehow gathered a group of people in another province because I'd come up from Durban to Joburg for treatment. And, and, and told these people about me because people were talking about me, people were talking about what I was feeling, people were talking about what I was going through. Right. And, and, and I, was, uh, yeah, I was a little bit wary of, 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 of what was going on. But I did see people that looked happier and healthier than I was. Mm. And, and, and so I thought, hang on a sec, you know, if these guys are talking on the same level as me and talking about a difficult day, and I heard Marco saying that everybody has smart days, um, generally they still had a smile on their face. They didn't look gaunt. They, they didn't look 
um, anemic or any of that. You know, they, they really looked healthier. So, so there was an impression made on me at my very first meeting. You spoke about arriving at the meeting. You hadn't bathed in a few days. Um, you were disheveled. You were in a terrible, terrible state. And yet they reached out and, and one person actually hugged you and, and made you feel like a human being again. 100%. I think what happened for me was that I held on to many reservations um, through my treatment program and after treatment, you know, I continued using, I hadn't cleaned up. Um, and and at the end of, the, you know, I kept going to meetings on and off and I wasn't capable of being really honest, honest with myself or anyone else. But I reached a point where, you know, I really, really hit rock bottom, um, one that was way worse than when I came into treatment and this was about a year after my first meeting mm. and uh, and I found myself literally at the end of the road I, I had uh, abused family friends acquaintances I, I, I had nowhere to go um, and, and I was pretty badly beaten up um, and, and, and about the only door left open to me was a narcotics anonymous meeting and, and, and I guess there are people who may have had an opinion of me when I walked in, but, but what really came for me was, you know, the guys that, that made room for me and, and offered me a seat and offered me a cup of coffee um, and, and really a hug. You know, I mean, you would run from, from me for a mile, you know, mm. the way I smelled and looked. Mm. But someone extended love and care to me. Hmm. And what... You said you had been to rehab, you had been to meetings before, you felt like you had hit rock bottom. For you, was uh, NA a case of handing the problem over to a greater power? And did that make it easier for you? One of the, the preambles in Narcotics Anonymous talks about us, in general, having exhausted medicine, religion and psychiatry as a means to facilitate change. And we found that you know, this worked. Um, for me, I grew up in a home that was observant, fairly religious, etc. So I guess I had that growing up. But the program of Narcotics Anonymous and the beauty of it is that it's not asking you to be religious. It's not asking for any religious affiliation. But it is, in step two, suggesting that we came to believe in a power greater than ourselves. Mm. And and. For me, initially, I, I was quite angry with God, as I understand God. Mm. But the idea that a collective power greater than myself was my Narcotics Anonymous group. Mm -hmm. People who were sharing their experiences, people who were offering suggestions in the breaks and after meetings. This, for me, was truly a power greater than myself. And, and, and as I worked the 12 steps and continued to work the 12 steps, um, inevitably, for me, the, the concept of higher power changed, um, and that's also okay. You know, and today it's 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 a higher power for me uh, has an association and affiliation to religion. And uh, and well, you're you're married, you because I know before with the drugs you were married, and then you got divorced, you had a child. Well, what is your life like today? I heard Marco talking about remaining grateful and it's very easy i think it's an inherent human trait that we want more um for the recovering community i think that's one of our problems is you know it's it's more is never enough mm. today it's, it's the little victories it's it's being able to wake up in the morning and and, and look out and, and look at the building in it um it's about appreciating my son it's about being there for my elderly mother one of the people that I abused tremendously. Mm. Um, and, and, and it's a mixed bag, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be about trees in the sky. I get into the car every morning and, and I'm really grateful for that. Yeah. Well, Anwar, thank you. Thank you very much for, for chatting. I wish we had more time. I, I think it's um, another uplifting uh, story, a story of hope. So thank you very much. Um, thanks for sharing that with us. It's been great having yeah. you on the show. You're very welcome, Nikki, if I may. Um, you know, there's a great Narcotics Anonymous South Africa website. Um, and, and, and as we discussed yesterday, there is nobody beyond hope. There is no mm. prerequisite in that you have to have hit rock bottom or lost everything or whatever. You know, if there's anyone out there that's in despair that thinks, you know, maybe things can be 
can can be better. Maybe things can improve. Maybe I have a problem. Then 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 check out a meeting. You know, we have forty odd meetings in Hakeng in on any given week. Thank you so much, Anwar. Thank you very cool. much. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. So that's uh, Narcotics Anonymous. Just go to the website. They have meetings really all over the country. And um, as Anwar said, uh, help is near. I just want to just very quickly tell you about um, a fantastic event that's taking place on the 27th of October um, at the Military History Museum at 5.30. It's, it's to commemorate the heroism of the Danish community during World War II uh, by saving their Jewish countrymen from certain annihilation. And it's in recognition of the 70th anniversary of that historic event in October 1943 the majestic film society is proud to screen miracle at midnight and it's a dramatization of that rescue mission it's starring Sam Waterston and Mia Farrow an outstanding movie and it's going to be a wonderful event Um, it is introduced by radio today it's happening on the 27th of October you can get more information from radio today Mark I'd like to thank you for coming into the studio thank you for your time thank you for the incredible work that you do for thank the inspiring for stories it's great thanks i have been inspired and uh, thank you for for tuning in thank you for listening and I, th- I hope that if you are in a dark place that you have seen the light if you have family or friends who are in a dark place that you can show them the light and i wish you lots of love and i, I thank you for tuning in until next week take care for me nikki seberini goodbye hi my name is svia prinsler and I'm the HID of IT integration at Bridwin Preparatory School in Melrose. We started using study apps about six months ago and have seen astonishing results. We were quite amazed to see how quickly the kids have been able to use study apps and the benefits it has shown with regards to reinforcing what they've already learned inside the classroom. I would highly recommend study apps for any school. Studyapps.co.za Conversations with Nikki was brought to you by studyapps.co.za, South Africa's leading education app for tablets.